Today is Palm Sunday. It marks the beginning of the last week in Jesus' ministry here on earth. Typically today, churches around the nation will have palm leaves in celebration. Unfortunately, all the palm trees are not in bloom yet in Murfreesboro. <clears throat> so I was not able to gather any up. But I do want to talk about what took place that day. And to be able to do that, I'm going to start in an, another area. So I'm, I'm going to need you to stay with me because I'll lose you if you don't get the first part of this, okay? If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 13, starting with verse 11. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that openeth the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, God, and the power that it holds. We ask, Lord, that you'll open our hearts to it, God, so we can apply it to our lives. We pray, have your way, God, and help us, Father, to be able to pray the prayer of surrender that Jesus did, not my will, but your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want you to say this with me. I want to speak to you for a little while on this topic. Praise or rage? Praise or rage, which way will you go? So let me lay out some groundwork for you. In the book of Exodus, Moses lays down a law that God has given him that when they get to the land of Canaan that God has promised them, when they get there, there's going to be a law that they will keep, and that is that the firstborn male of every animal will be sacrificed to the Lord. There are only two things that God will not accept as a sacrifice, and he lays it out here. One is a donkey, and the other is a man. Now, can you tell me if there's any connection or resemblance between a donkey and a man? I thought I heard somebody go, yeah. Everybody say stubborn. A stubborn will. Now, I want you to stay here with me because I believe that this, this is a type and shadow that God wants us to see. A donkey has a very, is very self-willed. It has a very stubborn nature. My father, as a child, plowed with a donkey. And he said that donkey was all right as long as I had him headed, you know, on the opposite end of the field. He said, but every time we turned and that donkey saw the barn... He was headed for that barn, and he, it was all he could do as a boy to whip that donkey and try and get it to turn around and continue to plow. The Scripture said here concerning the donkey that the donkey has to be redeemed with a lamb. And if you choose not to redeem the donkey, you have to break its neck. How many of you have ever had children that were stubborn you are not allowed to break their neck man had to be redeemed you, you didn't have the option with man you had to redeem the man with a lamb so think about this if your will isn't broke you better break it or God will how many of you know that God knows how how many of you have ever experienced stubbornness in your life? Not from you, of course. From those around you. Do you have any siblings? There were five in our house. And when siblings got together, the donkey nature took over. 
You, you know, my dad was, uh, he, he talked about how that he, he told my older brother, he said, Daryl, he said, all these kids can be getting along fine. He said, and you're not in the room for five minutes and you've got them going at each other, fighting and fussing. It was just, he was gifted at it. Everybody say it just came natural. natural. You remember that song, that country song said, all I got to do is act naturally. (laughs) How many of you have ever, don't raise your hand on this, but how many of you have ever acted naturally? You know, I'm talking about somebody cuts you off in traffic and you just act naturally. (laughs) And after you chase them down for about three blocks and you get a hold of yourself, you, oh, okay, okay, God, I hear you. You're lucky. Naturally. Isn't it amazing you don't have to teach your children how to be rebellious? You don't have to. uh, How many of you had some children that were very self-willed wave your hand hold your hand up i'm looking for moms and dads all across the house (laughs) now you can put your hand down those of you that raised your hand how many of you were very self-willed when you were a child (laughs) oh look out now what are you talking i'm telling you it just comes natural to us doesn't it and so having understood that i want you to go with me now to Palm Sunday. Keep in mind what we've just learned. Go with me to Palm Sunday, Mark chapter 11, starting with verse 1. And when they were nearing Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a donkey's colt tied everybody say a donkey's colt you will find a donkey's colt tied which has never been ridden by anyone untie it and bring it here and if any man say to you why are you doing this say to them that the lord hath need of him and straightway they will send him here and they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met And they loose him, if you would. They found the donkey tied in a place where two ways met. The question becomes, which way will you go? Now, there are a few things I want you to notice about this donkey, and I want you to remember the type and the shadow between a man and a donkey, is that God sent them, or Jesus sent them after the donkey because he was looking for a vehicle to carry his presence to the people. How many of you know that Jesus is still looking for a vehicle to carry his presence to the people. Turn around and just look your neighbor right in the eye right now and say, I don't think you understand. He's talking about you. God is looking for a vehicle or a someone that will carry his presence to the people. The problem is that that someone he's looking for is at a crossroads. They're at a place where two ways meet, and they're tied there. And they're trying to make up their mind, which way will I go? And there's a pull that's going on between them. Everybody say, the pull. So there's a constant tug on each side on which way they're going to go. There's something else you need to notice about this is he specifically said that this donkey had never been ridden before. Now what happens when you throw your leg over the back of a donkey that's never been ridden? 
you better get ready to hang on because it's going to be a hot time in the old town tonight. <laughs> that donkey is going to kick and fight and buck and thrust and dodge and dart trying to get you off its back. Why? Because that donkey has never surrendered its will to that of another. Oh, somebody hear what I'm saying today. We're in that same place. We're at a place where two ways meet, and God wants to use us to carry his presence. But if we haven't surrendered our will to him, when he starts to try and settle in on us, there's a whole lot of kicking and fussing and fighting going on. Let's learn a lesson from the donkey. They untied the donkey, and when they untied the donkey, the donkey didn't run. It's amazing that the donkey just didn't take off running. And they led the donkey to Jesus, and Jesus put his leg over that donkey that had never had anybody on his back before and that donkey doesn't kick that donkey doesn't fight that donkey doesn't buck or fuss why because he just experienced what it feels like to have the prince of peace settle into your life oh hear me today that's what the world is looking for they're running they're fussing they're fighting because they don't don't know him and we need someone that can carry his presence to the people so they can experience his peace yes. on the way into Jerusalem that day there's a lot of praise going on somebody say praise, praise. they're saying Hosanna blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord what are they saying praise God for the one that's come, Hosanna to God. And the, they are beside themselves with praise. Everybody say, everybody's praising. You ever get in a ballpark before where they do the wave? You know what I'm talking about? All of a sudden it starts and every, every, everybody in the park, I don't care how old you are, how young you are, you're there cheering on your team. And that when the, that comes, everybody goes, and it goes all the way across. Try it one time with me. Are you ready? On three. One, two, three. <laughs> Let's try it again. You need a little practice. You ready? One, two, three. Yeah, everybody's praising and everybody's in sync. And yeah, because then I'm there for my team and I'm shouting from the top of my voice. Yeah! Doesn't matter where you're sitting either. I was in the bleachers for a playoff game. Noisiest place in the park. I thought to myself, well, I'm back here in the bleachers. You know, it'll be quiet back here. I, was, I usually take a radio with me so I can listen to the play-by-play. -play. I shut the radio off. I had it turned up all the way and couldn't hear a word the announcer was saying. Everybody's ah! Praise going on. Say it again. Praise. How many of you ever been to a ball game? How many of you uh, like watching ball or, or you, you know, or any, any events, you know, that you get excited? Have you ever been to a concert? Hey, did you, uh, you ever been to a concert? That, that winter jam and, and, and spring jelly? You know, you, you, you're there and you're there to praise and everybody's praising God. They don't care who's... Everybody's praising God and carrying on and going on. And then we come to church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Preach, Pastor, preach. I'm telling you that when praise is real, it'll shake the place. It'll shake the place. They, they, they praise God. In the book of Acts, they praise God at Solomon's porch and Scripture said that the entire place started to shake because God inhabits the praise of his people. Man, that day, everybody's praising him. Peter's praising him. John's praising him. James is praising him. Judas is praising him. Everybody, thousands of thousands of Jews are praising him. Let's take a look at it. 
Need a little sound. Need a lot of sound. Is this Jesus of Nazareth? He's a prophet, a great prophet. A prophet? On a donkey? <laughs> Listen to the healing of the sick! So he comes in, and do you notice what they're not doing? They're not visiting with each other. Their focus is on him. They're not talking to one another. They're running toward him. And those that didn't know him are asking, who is this guy? A prophet on a donkey? I wonder if anybody's ever said that about us. What are you talking about? You mean to tell me that God would use someone like him? God, and that's exactly what he does. So all this praise is going, and it's, and man, it is moving the town. Everybody say Palm Sunday. One week later. One week later, the praise was turned to rage. And they were going a totally different direction. <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it, how quick we can go from praise to rage? Have you ever been there? Have you ever experienced it before? We start pointing at all the Jews saying, well, that was totally different crowd. I beg to differ with you. I'm persuaded that some of the same people that were praising him on Palm Sunday were yelling, crucify him the next week. Why? Because I know people and people are easily moved. People are easily swayed. And if you study scripture, you find out that the scripture said that the Pharisees instigated the people. They got the people worked up. All of a sudden, have you ever had someone that was your friend when nobody else was there? But when somebody else showed up, they acted like they didn't know you at all. fickle faith where all of a sudden we're praising him one day and raging against him the next day but before we get too hard on those that were doing it let's remember who was doing it Judas had been in that crowd Judas was praising him that day and Judas went from praising him to betraying him. He went from shouting out Hosanna to being the reason he's crucified. Well, yeah, but we know Judas was a rat. <laughs> Peter was in the crowd that day. Peter had been praising him, and Peter went from praising him to denying him. Peter went from shouting, Hosanna, to crying out, I don't know this man. It's so easy for us to be swayed sometimes. You ever feel it pop up in you? Rage. In an instant. The scripture says anger, but 
sin not. But here's what happened. Have you ever heard something that makes you angry? You know, and I mean, I mean, and, and, and verifiably so. I mean, justifiably so. Let me say it that way. That you, you hear about something that was done to a child or abuse or something that was going on in a home, and then all of a sudden you get, you get very angry and you're upset about it. And as you're dealing with that and trying to figure that out in your mind, you're thinking to yourself, man, I just, you know, they need to, uh. And your anger has turned to rage. Anybody ever experience it? Wave your hand at me if you know what I'm talking about. I got permission from Donna. She experienced it. She experienced it last night. She told me in between services, she said, I was getting ready to go to bed, and she said, I was watching the news, and they talked about a, a, a stack of bills that were being passed and said that the president is going to sign it when he, you know, that when it hits his desk, and they started reading the bills, and she said it was evil stuff and said, man, it just made her mad, and she started getting angry, and she walked out of that room and went to the bedroom and watch some house or home and garden or something for a little while then she tried to lay down and go to sleep and she said usually man i'm out like that she said it was 11 30 and i'm still tossing and turning and i'm thinking why can't i go to sleep and she said all of a sudden the lord said you're angry and she heard don't let the sun go down on your wrath she said i immediately repented before god and i immediately went to sleep <laughs> when which way will you go we've all been there we've all don't 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 sit today and act like you've never experienced rage if you're breathing you felt it if you've lived for any length of time at all it has tried to grip your heart and that's the problem is that's what happens is it starts out with just and it can start out with a holy anger but then before you realize it the devil keeps feeding it and he keeps pouring on to it and it's like putting fuel on a fire until it's raging to the point that you can't control it any longer Mike Jennings was is Mike are you in here Mike Mike sent out a picture his son had a fire that broke out in his back bedroom and and it was it he thinks an electric blanket started it and it was in there and it was burning and and it was just kind of contained in that bedroom and he didn't realize what was going on and when he walked and opened the door it gave that fire oxygen do you understand that's what the devil wants he wants you to let him breathe you got to choke him out you got to keep the oxygen away from the fire and let your praise deny him rage Judas focused on self-will and it led to self-destruction Peter focused on repentance and it led to redemption what what are you talking about how do you how do you know he focused on that because of what the angel said Peter denies knowing him three times. I don't know this man. And the rooster crowed. And Jesus' words came back to him. And when they did, Peter's convicted in his heart. And the Bible said that he went out and he wept bitterly. Any of you ever mess up? Stand up if you're in here and you have never messed up before. Because as soon as you stand up, you messed up. What are you saying? I'm saying that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all messed up. But it's what you do, which way you go with your mess up that determines whether or not you're going to get up or go down. And Peter began to cry out to God, and God heard it. God sent an angel to the women at the tomb that day and said, Go tell my disciples and Peter. What's he saying? He's saying, Peter thinks he's messed up so bad that he's not mine anymore. He said, but you let Peter know that I'm coming and I'm going to meet up with him in Galilee. And I thought about that conversation that he had with Peter. 
Everybody remember it? I, 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 Paul can't, or not Paul, Doug, come and give me a hand. Paul, are you in the house? Paul's not in the house. Is there a Peter in the house? Is there a Sam in the house? Kevin, come here. Pa pass them all. Y'all need to start inviting some folks that got different names. <laughs> so Peter finds himself in a struggle. He loves the Lord. He's the one. Wait a minute. Hang on. He, he's the one. He's the one that just had made the statement and said, when everybody said, when Jesus said, you're all going to deny me. Peter stands up and says, though all men deny you, I never will. I'll die for you before I deny you. You know the unique thing about this? Is Jesus already knew what Peter was going to do. But how did he act toward him? Did he say, you, get out of my face. I know what you're getting ready to do. I can't even believe you showed up. Listen to the conversation. You got the devil on one side. This is not typecast either. All right. Devil on one side pulling, Jesus on the other. And this is the conversation that went on. The conversation was, Peter, Satan has desired to have you so he can sift you like wheat. He said, but I have prayed for you. Now listen to this. Listen to this. He said, and when you're converted, what's he saying? He's saying my prayer is big enough to stop the devil from doing what he's trying to do in your life. When you're converted, strengthen your brother. Hear me today. God didn't save you to sit on a pew and take up space. He's got a purpose and a plan for your life. And it's time for us uh, to raise a shout of praise. Uh, it's time for us uh, to strengthen the brethren. Uh, it's time for us to let them know he's alive and well. Somebody shout yes. Th thank you, guys. Jesus knew what Peter would do, and he loved him. Jesus knew that whole crowd of believers on Palm Sunday that were shouting Hosanna would be yelling crucify. What's he do? He hangs on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Have you ever been there in your life at a place where you didn't know what you were doing? Where rage got so intense that it just... You know, you, you lost it for a moment. Wave your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Say, Pastor, I've never been there. Well, maybe you know someone that has. If you ever got to a place where you couldn't control it, don't beat yourself up over it. Recognize this, that if you could control it, you wouldn't need a Savior. <laughs> if you could handle it, he wouldn't have had to come. I had a guy meet me one time. I, I drove all the way to Chicago to see him, and I sat down with him, and he said, I'm a good guy. He said, I, I try and treat people right. He said, I'm a good guy. I said, I believe you're a good guy. I said, but if your goodness could have saved you, he wouldn't have had to die. The Bible said all have sinned. We've all got that inherent nature in us, and it comes naturally. So what we have to do is make up our mind which way we're going to go. Are we going to choose praise or are we going to rage? I want to praise him, don't you? I, I want to praise him. Ask yourself this question. When you go to McDonald's and they serve you cold French fries, how do you respond? I went through a drive through to get a hot apple pie. Had a cup of coffee. I was settling in for a good <laughs> snack. Healthy apples. <laughs> and I, I, I pulled it out of the box in that golden crust. Oh, man. I was getting excited and I bit into it. And that's all it was, was crust. 
It had sat in the warmer so long, all the dry apples had dried up. I was so mad, but I was several miles down the road. I thought the next time I go there, I'm going to tell them about that apple pie. <laughs> wow. Aren't you spiritual? <laughs> I'm just being transparent with you folks. I don't know how to walk on water. I, 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 do you hear what I'm saying? I don't know how to walk on water. But I do know that if I can surrender my will and allow the Prince of Peace to settle in over me, that an apple pie will never get my goat again. I know that if I can just let him settle in on me and touch me and hold me and keep me, that I'm going to be well. Let your, never allow your praise to turn to rage. Say, but pastor, what am I supposed to do? Because I already got rage going on. I mean, man, I've been mad my whole life. Now, you may laugh about that, but I talked to someone recently, and they told me, they said, I don't know what to do. They said that I have been angry all my life, and I don't know where the anger is coming from. But I knew where it was coming from. I knew the disappointment. I knew the hurt that they had been through. And I know how the devil manipulates your circumstance and situation to try and pull you in to a rage. And if you don't deal with the rage, one day the rage is going to deal with you. Say, but pastor, what am I supposed to do? How can, I mean, it's impossible. I, I, I can understand going from praise to rage, but I mean, how in the world are you ever going to go from rage to praise? Ask Paul. Paul's raging, man. He's religious. He goes to synagogue every Sunday. He shows up. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. If it does, when you go in a car, I mean, when you go in a garage, you're a car. That's not, it's not about the location you're in. It's about the condition of your heart. And while Paul's very religious, he's taking Christians and throwing them in prison, having them beaten and put to death. He is in a rage. The scripture said that while he was yet breathing out slaughter against the church, he chew you up and spit you out and never bat an eye until one day. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't leave you the way he finds you? Aren't you glad for the day that he stepped into your life and changed some stuff about you? You wouldn't have liked me before. You say, Pastor, I don't like you now. Well, you, you'd have liked me less then. <laughs> What are you saying? I'm saying that, that there's a transformation. And when he got a hold of Paul and Paul hit the ground and he looked up and he said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. But can I tell you that when God got done with him, he was a totally different person. Once the Lord restored his sight, filled him. Listen to what this says in Acts 9 and 20. And he immediately, this is talking about Paul. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is indeed the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed. You ever amaze anyone? I did. What are you talking about folks that knew me before I was saved? After I got saved, came to me and said, what happened to you? I smiled and said, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, I begin to share with them because, listen, when he apprehends you, it's not about platitudes and, and, and just cute little sayings. It becomes a reality in your heart. And nobody knows like you know what he did for you. Bailey sang that song, the oil in my alabaster box. When he saves you, you're willing to spend all you have to know him, to be able to come 
close to him because all your rage has been turned to praise and you're different than you were before. 